Cardiogenic shock. It's still one of the toughest challenges in acute medicine, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's a sobering reality. You know the numbers. The mortality rate is just brutally high, still hanging above 50% in so many settings. It is. We're highlighting seven essential truths that really refute some common clinical assumptions about how we should be managing these patients right now. Right. Let's start with time and the ischemic pump. If you had to pick one single intervention, the only one that's been repeatedly proven to reduce mortality in cardiogenic shock, what is it? It's early percutaneous coronary intervention. Yeah. Revascularization. That's it. That's it. The evidence is definitive. I mean, across study after study, it's the only therapy that has consistently shown a real substantial survival benefit. Okay, so can you quantify that benefit? What kind of numbers are we talking about here? Well, you can look back at the landmark SHOCK trial. Mm -hmm. That study showed immediate revascularization cut six-month mortality from 63% down to 50%. Wow, a 13 percentage point reduction. A 13-point drop. Mm -hmm. In a condition this lethal, that is, mm -hmm. that's massive. That's profound. So it makes the question of timing even more important. I mean, does every single minute really impact survival that much when the heart is already failing? It does, yes. Speed here is literally life-saving. The data is. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly clear about the cost of any delay. For every 10-minute delay in revascularization, you get 3.3 additional deaths per 100 patients. 3.3 additional deaths per 100 patients for just 10 minutes. Yes. That just reframes everything. It puts the responsibility on every single part of the care chain, not just the cath lab. It has to. It means time to revascularization really eclipses almost everything else when you're managing shock from an acute myocardial infarction. So the entire system has to be built for speed. Exactly. The whole focus has to be on crushing that door to balloon time because the clock is directly tied to who lives and who dies. Okay, so this is where the thinking has really changed. Let's say we get in there, we successfully open the culprit vessel, the one that caused the MI. Should we then immediately proceed with a full multi-vessel PCI? And you'd think so, right. But the answer, surprisingly, is no. 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 The Colmetra shock trial completely flipped that logic on its head. It demonstrated that just treating the culprit vessel first leads to better outcomes. Better than attempting an immediate, complete multivessel repair. Yeah. Much better. That feels so counterintuitive. I mean, we were all taught to fix what you see. Are yeah. we just setting the patient up for another event in the next 24 hours by leaving diseased vessels alone? That's the fear, but it's not what the data showed. Going after the non-culprit lesions right then and there, it increased the procedure time, it increased the contrast load, and it just added complications while the patient was at their most unstable. So less is more. Less is more, yeah. at least in that acute, you know, crashing phase. Avoiding those extra burdens is critical. Get in, fix the main plumbing problem, and get out. <laughs> okay, that leads us right to what we use for support. Let's talk about vasoactive agents. What should be the first-line choice for hemodynamic support now? The answer is norepinephrine. It's the established first choice. Okay. It just consistently outperforms the older options. You get better hemodynamics, fewer arrhythmias, and it's linked to lower overall mortality compared to, say, dopamine or epinephrine. And that is a huge change. I mean, for decades, dopamine was the go-to. So why are those older options, like dopamine and epinephrine, now essentially contraindicated as a first-line agent? They just come with too much cardiac toxicity. Both of them frequently make myocardial oxygen consumption worse. Which is the absolute last thing an oxygen-starved heart needs. Exactly. And on top of that, they have a much higher tendency to trigger malignant arrhythmias, which just destabilizes an already fragile system. Right. So we often think stronger squeeze equals better support, but the toxicity just wipes out any benefit. So this brings up a really high-stakes question. How does the total dose of pressors affect outcomes? This might be one of the most profound findings in recent shock research. The data confirms a very, very clear dose mortality relationship. It's not subtle. So the more you give. The higher the total cumulative dose of vasoactive drugs, the greater the associated risk of death. Period. That is a terrible tightrope for the clinician at the bedside. Yeah. You need the drugs for the patient to live moment to moment, but the drugs themselves are increasing the mortality risk. It's an awful position to be in. So when you're escalating pressors and you hit a wall, the patient is still unstable. What's the smarter next step, given this data? The smarter move is to stop escalating. Don't just keep stacking more drugs and hoping. Okay. That escalation is a huge warning sign that your primary therapy is failing. 
The right move is to recognize refractory shock early and immediately consider mechanical circulatory support. So a fast transition to a device instead of just maximizing drug toxicity? Exactly. That makes perfect sense. Let's talk about more targeted pharmacologic support. The Vosmandan is getting a lot of attention. What's its mechanical advantage over something like dibutamine or milrinone? So Levosimandan works as a calcium sensitizer. It boosts contractility by making the myofilaments more sensitive to the calcium that's already in the cell. Instead of just flooding the cell with more calcium, which is what dobutamine does. Precisely. And the theoretical benefit of that is what? Well, by avoiding that big rush of intracellular calcium, it theoretically lowers the risk of arrhythmias. And critically, it also lowers the overall oxygen demand for the myocardium. So it gives you the support without quite as high a metabolic price tag. That's the idea. Is it useful across all stages of shock, or do you need to be selective? You have to be highly selective. Timing is everything. It really only shows a clear benefit in very early stage shock. Specifically, SCAI A and B. Yes, SCAI A and B. For listeners who might not use those stages every day, could you just quickly define them? Of course. Stage A is at risk, and stage B is beginning shock. Right. So we're talking about patients with maybe some early hypotension, early signs of hypoperfusion, but they aren't in that classic established cardiogenic shock yet. Exactly. Its value in the more advanced stages, C, D, and E, is still very uncertain. It's really a tool for early intervention. Got it. Okay, shifting gears to another area where practice has changed dramatically, post-cardiac arrest care. We used to be all about aggressive cooling. What's the new standard for temperature control? The focus now is really just on avoiding fever. It's not about achieving aggressive hypothermia. So the big trials showed that targeting 33 degrees Celsius wasn't any better than 36. That's right. No superiority. So we don't need to drive patients down to deep hypothermia, but we have to be disciplined on that upper limit. Why is preventing fever so important? Hyperthermia after a cardiac arrest is just consistently and strongly linked with much worse neurologic outcomes. And preserving brain function is the ultimate goal. It's the only goal that matters in the end. So the job is to stay within that target range, usually 36 Celsius, and maybe most importantly, prevent that rebound fever after you stop active cooling. Okay. We've talked a lot about the heart, the arteries, the drugs, the devices, but if we zoom out, should we really be treating cardiogenic shock as purely a cardiac contractility problem? Absolutely not. And this is a fundamental shift in perspective. We have to move past that narrow pump-centric view. Okay. Mortality in cardiogenic shock very frequently results from multi-system organ failure. It's not just the heart stopping. So the heart is the spark, but it's the downstream systemic damage that actually kills the patient. That is precisely it. The sustained low output the high doses of pressors, the inflammatory cascade, that's what damages the kidneys, the lungs, the gut. You have to treat this as a system failure syndrome. Not just a plumbing failure or a pump failure. Right. That means we need to devote real resources to non-cardiac support, which can be tough when the blood pressure is in the tank. What non-cardiac measures, the things that can feel secondary, have been shown to directly impact survival. Every single system matters. Things like Meticulous nutritional support, aggressive renal management, including early continuous renal replacement therapy if you need it. Things that often get delegated or delayed because the cardiac crisis just sucks up all the attention. They do, and you can't let that happen. Effective infection prevention, even early mobilization. These are not extra. There's not elective. No. They directly influence patient survival because they mitigate that lethal downstream organ damage. They stop the systemic breakdown that kills the patient long after the heart has been stabilized. So to just bring it all together for your practice, managing cardiogenic shock successfully requires a truly multidisciplinary, highly coordinated approach. Right. Success depends on that immediate timing, yes, but also on a sophisticated understanding of the whole system's physiology and actively avoiding harm from you know, drug toxicity or delayed procedures. This evidence really marks a clear paradigm shift for all of us in acute care. Success is measured less by the specific drug you picked and more by the excellence of the system level coordination. And the swiftness of the execution. So what does this all mean for your hospital, for your daily practice? I think the most important question you can ask is this. How can we build clinical systems, the protocols, the teams, the communication that guarantee this type of early coordinated multidisciplinary care Every single time. Every time. Think about the specific system structure you work within right now. Is it built for that? 